Welcome everyone to the first of the New Look Q&As. The, those of you who've been here regularly will see that we've been kind of building the studio up over the last few uh, weeks and months, and now it's kind of almost complete. I put the icons on today. I won't get Jonathan's opinion on them. They're quite simple compared to the icons that you've been working with. Um, but this, I'm really, really pleased that Jonathan and John agreed to do this because um, it seems like the, a really good, uh, strong opening to, to this, hopefully this new uh, method of doing, doing the Q&As because you've become really influential on our thinking, my thinking and many of the people on the call, I'm sure, and real friends of the channel as well. And you both are exploring the most interesting area, I think, of um, what is what is the meaning crisis? What is the void that's left by the absence of religion and what could possibly fill it? There, there is no bigger and more important subject, I think. And I'll give a very short intro. Um, I'm sure many people will be aware of both Jonathan and John. John is a professor of psychology and cognitive science at Toronto University and famous for, or f famous in our, in our circles for the Awakening from the Meaning Crisis series which is a pretty astonishing 50 hours of, of TV, which is a rabbit hole that I'd highly advise that everyone go down. And Jonathan is an icon carver and an expert in religious symbolism. And I'd normally talk about your, each of your work, but I know that you both have already had quite a lot of dialogues with each other. Mm -hmm. So I mm -hmm. thought I'd start by inviting you to say what it is that you admire about the other's work. Uh, maybe I can start. I it was interesting, David. First of all, thanks for inviting us. I, I'm really, I think John and I, and, and a lot of people are kind of in this circle are just excited to see people ask questions and mm -hmm. try to, to uh, find some solutions to the, the meaning crisis, which, which John perfectly phrased, like perfectly named, let's say. And everybody kind of recognizes that calling it the meaning crisis is probably the best way to understand what's happening to us. I, I think that the thing that interests me the most about John's work has in from my state is most mostly that I feel like the, the way that he formulates the relationship between consciousness uh, phenomena and the human, the human, the, the way that the human person acts as a, as a, as a kind of crux between all of that. I feel like it's, it's a perfect. And also because he uses, let's say scientific language and language which is very technical or very precise i feel like he's helping people who are struggling with meaning crisis don't know look look at religion don't know even what religion's even talking about like what is religion about it's just these weird stories and these weird rituals and these weird myths and i feel like his language is a bridge to help modern people secular people to uh to understand what is this even about what is the subject of of uh of these ancient uh wisdoms and so to me that's really precious because that's also what i'm trying to do in my own in my own way and so his his vocabulary his language and uh the the the, the examples he gives in terms of consciousness have been those that i keep coming back to even even in my own videos, sometimes i find myself using the words that john uses and i'm like oh well, i know where that comes from <laughs> Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here with you, as always. And thank you, David, for uh, inviting the two of us. Um, I have a lot I appreciate about Jonathan's work. Um, so I have a, I, I, and Jonathan knows this, I have a, I have an ambivalent history with respect to religion. Um, and I have uh, through uh, sort of a, a both a personal and an epi epistemic struggle, uh, come to uh, a, a, a position that's more stable for me, in which I, I, I deeply appreciate, uh, and this means a lot to me, as Jonathan indicated, uh, the, a, the, the traditional religions, especially Christianity because of its role in the West, as, um, as living, and I don't mean to, and that's the correct uh, uh, adjective here, as living storehouses of wisdom tradition and that afford people powerful ways of overcoming perennial problems of self-deception, disconnection, enhancing um, the, those aspects of our cognitive processing, 
Um, and for me, cognition doesn't just mean ideas in your head that uh, enhance our connectedness to ourselves, to each other, to reality, um, that, and afford meaning in life. And so for me, uh, uh, when I look for somebody from the religious traditions, I'm not really that interested in people who just want to pound a particular metaphysical view on me. Jonathan has one and I respect it. And I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to dismiss that. But what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to compliment Jonathan and say what I appreciate about it is I see in Jonathan uh, a, a degree of insight that is at times astonishing. His ability to pick up on perennial patterns and, and understand how uh, symbolic language, symbolic pictures, symbolic imagery, symbolic action um, discloses those deeper perennial patterns um, it, it is often astonishing. And, and then to translate that into good counsel for uh, people at large and for his particular followers, uh, those two things together uh, bespeak uh, to me uh, some pretty central features of what I would deem uh, wisdom. And so I find it always valuable to pay attention to Jonathan's work and to talk to him about it. Um, I, I think, Jonathan, I mean, I, I, I don't want to embarrass him, but I, th I think Paul's right in that Jonathan is almost like a, a current church father in the, in the kind of uh, his symbolic grasp and, and the depth of innovation without being a heretic, at least he doesn't seem to be a heretic to me, uh, the, the, the grasp and innovation without heresy um, is really impressive. I think he would be in good company uh, with Augustine and Aquinas. Oh, sorry, Jonathan, those are from the Western traditions, perhaps uh, Dionysius and Maximus from the Eastern tradition. Um, and so, uh, and because I am so interested in all of these things, the, wis the, the wisdom, the wisdom tradition, um, the symbolic awareness, uh, the use of enacted and embodied symbolism uh, to try and uh, disclose aspects of reality that are otherwise not readily disclosable to human beings. Jonathan exemplifies all of this in his work and in the, in the leadership he shows in his community. And I admire him for that. And I always appreciate it when we have a discussion together. Awesome, that was fantastic. So just before we, we, we start, I'm just gonna recap the, the structure for today. Um, I'm gonna to invite John and Jonathan to dialogue with each other for around 20 minutes at the beginning before we go into the Q and A. And I know that a few people have already submitted questions. I'm gonna put the the link in the chat in a minute and people can go through there. And if there are questions they particularly like, you can put your initials in the right hand column and that will be a sort of upvoting system of the, the questions that have the most uh, people wanting them to be asked. Um, but we'd also like to use the chat for stuff that comes up during the, the conversation as well. So we can have a bit of spontaneity and we're not just going back to the questions that have been submitted beforehand. So if, you, if something comes up, any thoughts or any questions that come up during it, even if they're just fragments of thoughts, we can kind of start to, to use that and maybe throw them in. And I'm gonna invite Jonathan and John, even though it's going to be a Q and A format, to, to dialogue with each other and use the, use the questions as sort of uh, seed for, for more conversation as well. Um, so, and as, as I said, this will be going on the channel. So if you have a question, but you don't particularly, I'm, I'll, I'll ask you to unmute yourself and ask the question. If you prefer not to appear on the channel, just let me know and I'll ask the question for you. Um, and yeah, so we don't have to cut it out. And yeah, I'll, I'll start by saying, as I said at the beginning, what I love about both of your work is that you're asking the biggest questions uh, about the meaning crisis, especially what might fill the hole of this, uh, absence of religion. And I'd, I'd like to start maybe by asking where you're at in that inquiry um, and yeah, and where that interacts with each other's work potentially. And that might be a point to start from in the interaction. Well, Jonathan went first last time, so maybe I'll go first this time. Um, uh, so, where I'm at is, uh, I mean, <laughs> this, this is a long argument, uh, but uh, the, the, what I've been trying to do, and, and, and it was actually sparked by criticism made by Jonathan, um, which is um, 
you know, I, I, in Awakening for the Mini Crisis, I basically laid out what I thought were some important things that we have lost. Uh, we've lost really wisdom traditions. We've lost ecologies of practices for cultivating wisdom. And when I say wisdom, I al always mean also the enhancement of meaning in life. The, so wisdom and flourishing is, is what I mean when I say wisdom. Um, and I talked about uh, the need to recover um, uh, uh, in um, a really explicit manner, our connections to procedural knowing and perspectival knowing and participatory knowing and, and to uh, use that to create ecologies of practices. And then Jonathan made, um, I think, uh, you know, and I take, his, I take his criticism seriously, he pointed out that, you know, I seem to have, you know, all these, uh, he, I think he called them individual mystical practices, which, which is fun. Um, and um, I, I, I thought about that very deeply. And I thought about, um, that was right. I thought that was a fundamental hole in my work, um, and it was it was it, it was kind of an egregious hole because I'm a firm believer in what's called extended cognition, one of the four E's of four E cognitive science, and that most of our cognition is done in distributed cognition. We network brains together with culture way before we networked computers together in the internet, and so I, I, I like and I do work on this, and yet the argument, the conclusion I'd got to at the end of Awakening had left that out and Jonathan rightly pointed it out and, uh, and, and, and rightly said this is a distinct advantage, not that there's competition necessarily, but a distinct advantage that the, uh, the existing traditional religions have. Um, and I wanna do note that Jonathan often says religions, he very much is pluralistic, um, even though he is committed to uh, a particular version of Christianity. Um, so, I started thinking about that, and then there's an area of overlap between uh, Jonathan's commitments and mine in terms of uh, the Neoplatonic heritage. And I realized that um, the ancient Western wisdom traditions had a, 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 it's actually a family of practices, but right, uh, that were organized around trying to um, enhance the intelligence of distributed cognition into, uh, uh, into basically uh, into uh, distributed wisdom, collective wisdom, something that is a theme. Actually, I, I take it for rebel for this actual channel, and that that uh, that involves the, a practice uh, that was regarded as the capstone practice uh, of all these wisdom traditions, which which was dialectic, which was a practice that integrated the individual cultivation of wisdom with the collective cultivation of wisdom in a reciprocal and mutually affording fashion. And so, I've been engaged um, uh, most recently with the help of Christopher Master Pietro and Guy Sandstock and Peter Lindbergh and others at trying to uh, reverse engineer from the ancient texts, uh, from uh, overlapping practices uh, that exist within the traditions and um, from the best cognitive science, what dialectic might look like and how it can bring about a state uh, that I call dialogos where people feel that they, they feel and they feel with good reason that they are participating in, um, they're participating online in real time in the unfolding, uh, both cognitively and phenomenologically of collective wisdom. And then that can help them uh, communicate with each other, coordinate with each other, cooperate with each other in the creation, curation and maintenance of ecologies and practices. And so that's something that has uh, been, some, I, something that I have been working a lot on and that seems to be also putting my finger on the a particular pulse of the meeting crisis, because we have a lot of these communities. I've been speaking at conferences, speaking to these groups in which these ecologies of practices and dialogical practices and mindfulness practices and movement practices are all coalescing together. And I find this both deeply encouraging and that um, and, and it's something that is actually dominating my thinking right now. Um, so. Uh, that has, I think, a lot of connections uh, to what um, you would find in uh, a lot of religious contexts, and I'm sure Jonathan might have some uh, relevant and insightful things to say about it. So thanks, John. I, I'm happy. I'm really. I'm happy to. I think that I've never heard you formulate it as clearly as you just did now, in terms of where you are and and kind of how you see this this importance of 
distributed cognition, you could call it, or com communion is maybe the word I would I would call it in terms of how we need we need the mystical experience to stack up in terms of it can't just be an individual thing. Uh, I think that the reason the fact of wanting to think of spiritual experience or spiritual reality as being an individual thing is actually one of the symptoms of the meaning crisis disease, right? That comes out of a kind of uh, this kind of new age spirituality where you just, you just, it's really just for you and you're doing your own thing. And so, so I appreciate it. I'd say where I stand, I mean, you, no one's going to be, be surprised when I tell you where I stand is that I, I think that this has, I think that instead for me, instead of wanting to, to create new ecologies or new communities or new types, I think that the best thing to do is to take the, to take what has been given to us and to try to fill it with as much meaning as possible. And so my approach has been to take a very, a Christianity, which I admit has been, beaten and uh you know reduced to almost nothing in terms of you know since the enlightenment it just has been kind of receding in the intellectual uh world and has been uh and to the fault of many religious people themselves who in in embracing a kind of weird materialism then they they have these their world and, and john you express it perfectly where their myth, mythological world and their kind of actual the world they live in it just doesn't mm -hmm. fit anymore mm -hmm. right it just completely disjuncted but they continue to maintain both and then it creates a very shallow spirituality um and so my my approach has been rather to reinfuse christianity uh both with the wisdom of the fathers and with the with what i believe was really the original christianity and i don't just believe it i see it in the text and i see it in the the hesychastic or the myth, mystical traditions of the church uh, and try to formulate it in a way that can help people today connect with it. And so the fathers obviously didn't speak about phenomenology. They didn't talk about, you know, and because they didn't have this, this meaning crisis. And so I tried to connect, I tried to help people understand that the myth mythology of the Bible is still accessible to you if you're in your body and you're experiencing the world. And, and that is, that to me is enough to be able to, to, to enter into the story um, and not feel the need to justify what's in those stories scientifically, but to, to justify them phenomenologically. Um, and so that's been, that's really where I stand is I don't, is I think that wanting to create all these new ecologies of, of practice, although I, I understand facing the, the superficial nature of Christianity today, is I think that it's, it's not going, to, it's going to increase the meaning crisis in, in the sense that it's going to fragment us more than what we are. Um, and it might help people. Like, I really believe that it helps people. And I, and this is very sincere when I, when I say that, I think that the practices that John you're, in, you're involved in, that other people are involved in that individually, they might be able to make their lives better to, to kind of cohere, to have, to, to have a path that, that is clear to them. But in order for it to stack, I think that we I think that for now, resurrecting practices that have been gone or have been resurrecting practices that have been assimilated into Christianity and whatever is living of them is, is within the Christian tradition, but trying to resurrect them from outside. Uh, I think that it's going to work a little bit, but it's, it's ultimately, maybe it's just because I tried, I'm, I'm trying, I see things, I'm trying to see things on a bigger scale, which maybe is part of, maybe is pride on my part. I don't know. Uh, but, and also the, the other problem that I, I see that I've, I've mentioned is I think that one of the things religion does or Christianity does is that it, it, it exists at every level. And so a lot of the practices that, that, uh, that John you're involved with, with Guy and these other types of people aren't accessible to my aunt that dropped out in the, you know, in the ninth grade, like they, they aren't. Whereas within, within the Christian narrative, the part of Christianity that Sam Harris criticizes, I like, I don't mind that because it's for my, my aunt and it's, it's okay. As long as there are people that understand the higher aspects within the culture, that's fine. That part can stay like the kind of naive, almost, almost kind of superficial uh, understanding of the stories and, and this more kind of emotional involvement and all that 
is necessary because there are people that are there and they'll never be anywhere else. So that's where, that's kind of where I stand in terms of, of that. Um, well, uh, yeah, so uh, as Jonathan uh, for, foretold, I, I wasn't surprised by any of that. Um, and um, I, I, so uh, I, I'll, I'll respond to it. First of all, I take what Jonathan said seriously. I've already indicated um, that I take what he says seriously. Um, I think there's a couple, there's some relevant factors that um, I, I would, would, would point out why I'm, why I'm taking the stand I do. Um, first of all, uh, I don't present anything I'm presenting as exclusive. Um, it's not like you have to do this and you have to abandon Christianity to do it. I never do that. That is, that is not something that's on offer. So that's not part of my engineering design, if, I'll, if you'll allow me to use uh, Jonathan, uh, Jonathan Hall, uh, uh, not Jonathan, Jordan Hall's uh, uh, terminology. Um, and, and what in fact has happened repeatedly, this is only anecdotal, but it's happened repeatedly, is I have people from various faith traditions, uh, Buddhism, Christianity, Islam, get involved in the ecology of practices uh, and, and join the community, the Sangha that has grown up around that and be nurtured in their particular religious view. So first of all, it's not, it's not exclusive. There, there, there's not like, it, it has to be that way. And, and that's, that's actually deliberate on my part because um, as, as a non-theist, um, I want to afford as much good faith, and I use that with multiple meanings, uh, good faith dialogue between people who are within these traditions and people who are without these traditions. And that's really important right now because the nuns, the N-O-N-E-S, are the fastest growing group in the world. And they are not new atheists. That is just a fundamental misunderstanding of that group. You do more demographic work on them and you see what they're doing is higgledy-piggledy religion of me, right? Where they, where they right? Uh, spirituality is the nondescript term for how people autodidactically and in a fragmented fashion try to address these issues. And, and then, then, there, then there's a lot of, there's a lot of deep reasons out there um, that I, and, and, and I don't wanna be, I don't wanna, I don't wanna project a kind of coarseness onto Jonathan or Paul, for example, that's not the case. But what I mean is there's lots of people who have suffered at, I'm one of them who've suffered at the hands of religion and they have, there's a, there's a degree of trauma uh, there are people who, uh, because of the way uh, they, they, you know, the way they can't reconcile religion with uh, the scientific technological worldview are off put from it. Um, and there's also people who don't like the fact that, and Jonathan admits this, and he has a response to it, and I'll, I'll allow him to make that, so I'm not foreclosing. But, you know, Christianity has become, since the Enlightenment, very much like another ideology, just a system of ideas. And people are sick of ideologies and the way they have drenched the world in blood. And so they're afraid of meta-narratives, to use the postmodern jargon, right? And so for all of those reasons, it, you know, people are going to find it extremely difficult to just return, I think, to the traditional religions. And so I think... Again, and precisely because like what I just said, I'm not proposing something that's exclusive. What I'm trying to build and offer is something that is directly trying to provide something uh, to those people. Um, I also think it's the case, I do, Jonathan was kind, he didn't use the, the word, but he could have. There's an elitism uh, that uh, is a, an issue for what I'm proposing, um, and I get that. Uh, but I do want to point out that a lot of these things were more widely disseminated than people realize. Uh, Stoicism, which much more widely disseminated in the ancient world, uh, they, you know, there were uh, many of the Roman soldiers in the army carried around the manual for living. Um, and it, so it reached from Epictetus or Epictetus, who was a slave, up to Marcus Aurelius, who was an emperor. Um, and so, uh, you know, these wisdom traditions and practices um, can disseminate and Notice how earlier, even earlier scientific worldviews or models uh, become widespread. Almost everybody in here uses Freudian language. Freud has just disseminated, perhaps even to your aunt, uh, Jonathan. And so 
Um, the fact that this stuff can decide good, good ideas uh, uh, that um, are well articulated uh, do have a power to disseminate in powerful ways. And then finally, I mean, I do take seriously uh, Jordan's point that we're in a really, we're in a place where the rate of change um, is increasing. Uh, and so we need to have, so we need some important innovation in how we're trying to deal with the current, this current version of people struggling with perennial problems. And we also have, we have cognitive science that we didn't have before. And what it can provide for us and, and the fact that it might innovate new psychotechnologies that turn out to be extremely valuable, um, I think that's a resource that should not go untapped. I think we have to use get all hands on deck to do everything we can to try and address the meaning crisis. So that's how I would reply uh, to Jonathan. Do you want to respond to that, Jonathan? Yes, yeah, I mean, sure. Uh I think that I, I understand. I understand especially the, the trauma in the sense that I, I see it. I grew up also in a very similar community that John grew up in, a, a kind of uh, fundamentalist world, um, very superficial. Luckily, my parents, my father was not that way. My father was, was very bright and very curious. And so maybe that's the reason why I kind of found my way uh, through to Christian mystics. Um, but I, I, I understand and I sympathize with that position. And I think that I see it, I see it as, a, as a challenge in a way, in the sense that I see it to me as a challenge to be part of those who present Christianity in a way that, that appears to be life-giving and doesn't appear as this dead, boring thing. And so I don't see it. I see it as more, that's how I see it. I just see it like, okay, Jonathan, you need to roll your sleeves up and you need to understand what you're living and understand why you think it's valuable and then be able to present it in a way that people will see not as just one one more ideology but actually as a as a life-giving thing so yeah well i, I yeah i and uh, um, given the sincere uh, uh compliments i gave you earlier um you know, I, 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 I get that that's what you're doing and I, I, you're having success at it. Um, I guess, I mean, I've asked you this question before and, 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 and so I don't expect you to have like, um, I don't know, like, you know, well, no, John, I thought about it and here's my, you know, my four premise argument that will completely answer it. Uh, that's not what's gonna happen, I get that. But see, the issue I have is the, the context um, I mean, which is, you know, you, the problem I face is the problem of, of elitism, but, mm. um, but you, you, I would say you face the problem of pluralism. You face yeah. the problem uh, that we now, it's increasingly difficult, um, like, and, and you typically don't do this. So I'm not accusing you of anything, you know, sort of a ham-fisted apologetic pro project of, Here's why Christianity is the one true religion and why all the others are sending people to hell. I grew up with that, by the way. So, um, you know, that, I'm not I'm not just making that up. Um, I, I, in fact, I, I regularly remember pe people in my church would identify a religion with the phrase sending millions of people to hell every year, um, which was. And so um, the issue that for me is that and and I don't and I, I'm not I'm not a dilettante pluralist. I practiced for decades in within a Taoist tradition, a Buddhist tradition, and also I grew up with Christianity, and I have invested even more time into Neoplatonism as a way of life. Um, and so I take very seriously it, it, that no, no one of these paths seems to have any exclusivity um, that they, and that they the relationship between them is not best understood as competition, but as philia, as a mutually shared love and friendship for wisdom. And so for me, trying to come up with a way that, a way of giving people access to wisdom traditions and ecology of practices that takes pluralism very seriously is a central issue for me. Yeah. And I know we've talked about this before, so I, I don't feel I'm being unfair to you. Uh, no, no, yeah, I don't think you're being unfair. I would maybe I could phrase it this way. Maybe it'd be a way that I, 
I'm not sure I phrased it this way before, but I would say that I think that any appreciation I have of other traditions has to be from where I am. That is, that is, I have to be able to appreciate the insights I get from Islam or from Hinduism or from Buddhism from the position that I am, that I'm in, which is as a Christian. And I think that to me, that's the actually the balanced place to be. Because if we pretend like we're not part of a, of a, of a lineage, we're not part of a tradition, and then we want through a desire for pluralism to not have your feet in an, in an actual path. Uh, first off, it's like, in the end, we're not like, we're, we're not actually just standing above the path and looking at them. And, and it, it's not actually happening. There's a, there's something that's not completely real about, about that. Um, and so the question is, where are we standing if we're doing that? And I think like in your case, I would say it's probably more on the cognitive science side that is, there is a story of cognitive science in which you you are embedded, and a, and a, and that's fr from that place where you look at the different traditions and you see you see the um, you can see their value. Whereas for me, I really think that to be in the place that the West, like what the West has handed down to us, or what the Christian tradition, what the when I see even when we say East and West, like to me, the orthodoxy is still West compared to everything else like compared to all the other traditions it's still the west uh and so what what we've received and then how now and so but you'll see you if you anybody who's following me will see that i constantly quoting mythological stories i'm constantly diving into fairy tales i'll quote rumi i'll quote uh the bhagavad gita but i'll do it marginally but i will because i do see insight and i want to show that there's insight everywhere but i have to do it from where i am I don't know if that I don't know if that's the best way to explain it. I, I think that's a very good and authentic answer. Uh, um, in that, um, I, I, I'm not proposing um, that people can leap out of cultural uh, or their cultural or their history and take some go uh, God's eye view. Um, and um, um, I hope it doesn't seem to you that I'm doing that because, like I, like I said, I commit lots of time and, uh, and effort to developing um, uh, decades within these traditions, not just dabbling or anything like that. Um, what I suppose I would want to say, I have an analogy. Um, first of all, I want to say that there's evidence, evidence, uh, you know, from actually one of my graduate students, uh, empirical evidence supporting Jonathan's claim in one way and challenging it another. So uh, what's the claim? Uh, like overwhelmingly people who have committed themselves to a tradition by all of the best measures we have and we're getting pretty good, we're getting better measures and theory on this. They, they turn out to be wiser than people who are outside of a wisdom tradition. So if you can, you know, and, and I'm gonna piss people off probably when I say this, but you know, people within a, a, a particular religious tradition generally do better on wisdom measures than people who are purely secular. The, the evidence keeps mounting on this. I know, I know people don't like when I say that uh, because no, that must not be true. I'm sorry. Uh, okay. But, and so that's the part that Jonathan was probably, you know, cheering about the confetti's falling. But the part that's problematic is that that same research shows that no one of these paths has any distinct advantage over the other. Right? And so that's, that's the part maybe where the clowns come out or something. I don't know. Uh, but um, I have an analogy about that. And I want to I want to present it to you, Jonathan, because I don't think I've done that before. So I, as a, as a martial artist, I grew up with lots of people who were purists, right? Stay in your tradition no matter what, right? And that was that was the thing. And people who did, did, stood out, stepped outside of their, you'll never get to the depths. And then about 15 years ago, we had the MMA revolution, which actually is backed by a lot of good cognitive science, that people that integrate across the traditions regularly kick the ass of the purists because they do have just a richer, more complexified, adaptive repertoire of skills and maneuvers to bring to bear. And I'm suggesting to you that couldn't that be the case also for these, you know, we have martial art traditions, 
couldn't there be something like the analog of MMA for the wisdom traditions? And that's kind of how I'm seeing what I'm trying to do. Um, I think it's an interesting idea. I, I, think it's a, I think it's an interesting idea. I would tend to think that the, one of the, one of the difficult, let's say, how can I say this? One of the things in MMA, which is, which is clear is that, you know, you know, it works because the other person gets beaten and, and they're down. Right. And so the difficulty with spirituality is prelest is that people self aggrandize and imagine things and think that they're doing great. And they think that they're spiritual when they're actually extremely uh, selfish and extremely self-centered. And so one of the difficulties that I've had with the hodgepodge approach is mostly that you tend to accrue to yourself things which you which you're fine with and you don't have to deal with the harder aspects of spirituality because you've got no one to hold it up to you right you don't have a spiritual father to say you need to fast and you're like oh no I like this prayer stuff but I don't want the fasting stuff like who needs that it's just it's just bogus uh, and so one of the things that a tradition does is that it forces you to deal with things that you don't want to deal with and even even in terms of church like church has a lot of functions but one of the things church one of the functions of church is that it's not it's actually not a place of like-minded people that get together it's not like a club of people who are all uh let's say like let's say the people that are following my videos and we have groups symbolic world groups of discussion it church is not like that church is the jerk and the the bigot and the the, the the person who can't stop talking and all these annoying people that you have to deal with all the time, uh, which is part of which is part of the spiritual growth, which is you're forced to deal with things. It's similar to family in that sense. You're forced to deal with things and people and practices that you don't like and you don't want to do. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why. Although I think the, the image of the MMA is actually, is, actually uh, is, a, is an interesting idea. The best would be to have wise saintly figures who can integrate the best from, from the wisdom traditions and then be able to teach it in a way that, is, that fits within the world. Like, so I can imagine Aquinas, like Aquinas reads Averroes and reads the, mm -hmm. the, the different, and Dante obviously read, uh, you know, uh, obviously read some Sufi mystics. It's clear that he did. And so, yeah. but then when he presents it back, then he presents it in a way that's palatable for my aunt and for all like kind of normal people. That's how I see the, the that's how I see the best version of your MMA analogy. Well, so, I, I like that one. Like okay, go ahead, sorry. John, I'd like to um, start to shift more to the Q&A section. Sure. Um, Joe Cole has a great question about symbology, but before we move on to that, I'm just going to invite uh, Nick and Adriana had some really good questions in the chat on this topic. So maybe if we just respond, I'd just like to invite those in. And maybe if we respond to that, and then we'll move on to Joe's question on symbology. Are we, uh, are we supposed to read the questions, uh, no, David? Nick, are you... Nick, would you like to oh, okay. unmute yourself and ask the question you put in the chat? Me? Did you just ask me? Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. I just was, the question was simply like, let's say I grew up as a Muslim and I was a bit slightly traumatized by Islam and not particularly satisfied with it. Would you, taking the, the argument you guys are both making to its logical conclusion, would your advice to me be to return to core Islam or to core Christianity or to John's religion that isn't a religion? Like what, what, would I, what would I supposed to do if I was that person based on your, like, your logic? I'll, I'll go first, Jonathan, if you want then. Um, I mean, that's a difficult question to answer, Nick, and I'm, I'm not gonna dodge it, I'm gonna try and answer it, but I wanna qualify it because, I mean, that's a question that depends on more information about your particular idiosyncratic background. Um, uh, you know, and, and well, I'll tell you, my, my father's a Muslim, my mom's English. Um, he wasn't particularly orthodox, but I didn't love what he told me about Muslim. And I don't, there's a lot about Muslim I don't particularly think is great, but whatever. I, you know, I mean, I wasn't that traumatized. There were some crazy people in my house that was super sort of orthodox. And I saw that and I was like, wow, that's right, not right. cool. 
So, I mean, I would recommend to you that you, uh, instead of thinking of uh, a tradition first, um, I, I think seriously what Jonathan said a few minutes ago, and I'll try and maybe respond a bit to it, about, you know, traditions, tra traditions should challenge our narcissism. Um, and, and I think that's an important point he just made. Um, I don't think that um, my analogy was meant to uh, uh, ignore that. So, but I don't think you necessarily have to start that. But typically what people do is they start the wrong way around is what I'm trying to say. They start with what beliefs uh, do I really agree with? And then I'll try and find uh, the tradition accordingly. I think you should first, and now I'm gonna speak more as a cognitive scientist. Maybe Jonathan's right. That's maybe ultimately where I stand. Um, I think you should find the practices that are bringing about uh, transformation. And, and, and this is what I say to people when I'm teaching them the meditation and the Tai Chi. Your judgment about the transformation isn't the primary thing. If people around you, independently of you doing, like keep it as almost a secret as much as possible, if people around you are noticing the transformation, noticing the healing, then that practice is taking for you. And you know, this is this is the classic, and this is across multiple religious and philosophical traditions. By your by their fruits, you shall know them, right? So take up practices that are leading to real transformation. And then you do some of the scientific work on them, read about them, because each practice has has strengths and weaknesses. Try to find at least two practices that have complementary strengths and weaknesses that are bringing about real transformation in your life that other people are reliably reporting to you. Then once you see what it's taking for you, then start to look around for a home, a home that will do one of the things that Jonathan says that will give you a like will give you somebody who can give you feedback, critical feedback, uh, things like that. That would be my recommendation to you. That's what I start with. What is leading reliably and not just your own first person perspective, because that's actually not our wisest perspective, but what you have good reason to believe from other people, find those practices that are healing and transformative precisely because they are challenging that, and then find a home for them. That's the advice I would give to you. Well, I would, what I would maybe say, especially in your situation where you, you seem to have a come from two, let's say two sides. And also do you live in, I think you seem to live in Europe or, you know, you seem to have at least been connected with, uh, with, with Western culture. Uh, I think that what John said is is very good. Maybe from from the other side, I would say one of the things that you can do quite simply is to read to read. Let's say, especially if you're if you have these two histories with Islam and Christianity, I would say to read the story, to read the story of the of the two figures, for example, right? To just read the story of Christ and to read the story of Muhammad, and to to see. If there, if if there's one of those stories that you identify with, that 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 you can that, how can I say this? That you feel that you can enter into that story, and uh, and then, and then because it, and like I said, it, I think that there's no way that we could do that work for you. Like you, if if that's something that interests you, I would suggest that, um, and move from there. Great. So I'd like to make a slight uh, dog leg into the question about symbology from Joe. Joe, would you like to, to ask your question? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. yeah, it's great to be with you guys. I'm going to post in the chat because I have a slightly northern accent and um, I don't articulate myself so well. And I think my internet connection is a bit sketchy as well. Uh, but I have to give a shout out to Ethel, who's also helped sort of think with this one a bit so if she wants to add anything to the end um, I'd like to invite her to do that um, so you both covered symbology in movies stories you know Jonathan's covered uh, Super Mario and the symbology of that uh, and the archetypes portrayed do you think the world need is waiting on a new story whether it be a book movie series or mythology uh, that's message is powerful enough to in revive or invoke value in wisdom practices that could shift the current operating system into a new direction. What sort of symbolism 
um, old and possibly new archetypes do you think best portrays the times we find ourselves in? And what symbolism do you think would be useful for such a story if, if we were to have one? Um, well, the first thing I would say is that there's a, there's a marked difference between uh, entertainment and actual religious stories. I'll, you know, and although movies and video games and novels and all of this can have patterns, the same patterns that you would find in mythological stories or in religious stories, we always have to remember that the, myth, the myths and the Bible stories, they're, they're our stories. Like the Greeks, the, the, the story of the gods were their story. Like they weren't just stories that they told each other that they kind of made up. They were their stories. They were their, their origins, their, their, their God. They're the ones that they celebrated and the ones that they had massive temples that they went and sacrificed animals to. So it was an active part of society. Our entertainment culture is not active. It's a passive form of culture where we sit and we watch and we appreciate. Uh, and so I don't think that there's any movie or any, any novel or any, and none of that, that will be able to revive us from the, from the meaning crisis. It has to be, it has to be an active thing. It has to be something that we can participate in, that we can identify with, and that we can see as a story we can be, that we can be part of. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why if something is going to happen, it has to happen in the world. Like it, it has to happen in the world of people uh, for there to be a kind of symbolic shift. And I, and I don't think that that's impossible. That's why all religions have an eschatological vision. They have this idea that there's something coming, that there's something coming which will change everything. And I believe that. I believe that there is something coming that will change everything, but it has to happen. We can't make it up. And it's not, and it's not in movies and in, and in video games that we're going to get it. Uh, so that's the first part. In terms of the second part, what sort of symbolism possibly portrays our times? I'm afraid, I'm sorry to have to tell you that it's, it really is kind of end of the world symbolism. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I, I just hate to have to, to point it out. But uh, if, you look at, if you look at kind of uh, the book of Enoch, uh, when Enoch, you see similar things as what we're seeing happen around us. If you, if you read the descriptions of the Kali Yuga, if you read, you know, in all the different traditions, they have visions of what, what the end of a, of a world looks like. And that's really the, the imagery of what's going on in terms of the fragmentation, in terms of the excesses and moral excesses, uh, in terms of excess of rigor too, like tyrannical governments. Uh, all of this is our images that are brought, that are suggested in, let's say, uh, end of the world stories. And so I don't want to sound like I'm sounding some kind of alarm, uh, but but that's definitely the type of imagery that, the type of imagery that represents our world the best, I think. So um, uh, I agree with Jonathan uh, to a very significant degree. In fact, that's how we met. We independently converged on the idea of the zombie as a as as a myth. Uh, as opposed to just an, a form of entertainment that was emerging to express uh, the meaning crisis. And the interesting thing about the zombie is it isn't just a, mo mo uh, a mode of entertainment. People engaged in zombie walks and rituals and weird stuff like that. Um, so the interesting thing about it, and this goes to the, the book I wrote with Christopher Master Pietro and Philip Misovic, is the, you see, saying, uh, the, it, I don't want to get into a useless argument about uh, how perennial or archetypal these things are. Uh, you know, Jungian arch archetypes are famously uh, vague and slippery, and so, um, and, and uh, you know, saying whether or not a story is new, I think, is going to be undecidable if we're coming at it in that framework. I think, in an important sense, the zombie myth is new because uh, there, there's some precursors. But to lose another said, you know, it's the first, it's it's the myth of the 20th century. It's a new thing, and it's it, you can even see it change literally within decades. It was originally something uh, that was trying to express um, uh, the effects of slavery, 
And then it, it lost that connection completely and became this completely other thing within decades. Mm -hmm. And so in that sense, you can see new stories emerging. Now, I know the Jungians are going to say, oh, but the monster. And, and, yeah, and, and that's exactly the debate I don't want to have. OK, so there's something there. There is a case in which new stories can emerge in the way that I'm talking about here. Um, now, I think a new story is also emerging. And again, um, I can hear people grumbling, but it's an old story. In one sense, it has to be. Uh, but what's happening and what you see in a lot of these communities is, and, and this is convergent with it, which what's happening in cognitive science, and it's very much the return of the body. There, there is, and I think Jonathan is right. The symbolism we should be paying attention to is not in movies, but the symbolism that people want to enact. And what's happening is in the embodiment movement is people want to enact symbolic change. Like Rafe Kelly's work when people want to go out and do parkour in nature and, and, they, and then they want to tell stories about what they just did that day. And that's where, and what's happening is the body is returning and it's also returning in science and pay attention, right? That's what I'm, I, I'm saying. Pay attention when you see something returning that was neglected both in the culture and in, in science. And I'm not talking about the body as the object by which we pretend that we're bloody immortals and we'll always be useful and all that bullshit in our commodification of the body that I find r close to disgusting. I'm talking about people understanding that embodiment is fundamental to who and what we are and that and, that, and science Cognitive science is coming to the view that embodiment is essential and mm -hmm. fundamental to understanding our cognitive processes and meaning making. And when you see a bottom up swell where people are going out and enacting symbolism and bringing about transformation and a top down scientific, almost a revolution, I think that's a matrix in which new stories are gonna be born for us right here, right now. I like, I like the idea of embodiment in the sense that you could also see it because at first, when you said the return of the body, I was like, eh, I don't know about that. But when you say embodiment, then yes, then yes. I I agree in the yes. sense that embodiment is actually the joining of heaven and earth, right? It's the joining of the above and the below because it's it's kind of the incarnational principle where you have potentiality that is joined with, and so that sense that, and and you know it's real when you're in, when when it's embodied, right? You know it's real when oh. it's when it's happening. Oh. Totally. Right. That's the proof of the MMA proof. It's like, you know, it's real when the guy goes down, right? You, you, when you win the fight, then you know, it's real, but it, it's the same. Like if I have these ideas about art, but I'm not, I'm not making art objects, then there's a, there's a disincarnation, you know, uh, when I'm practicing carving and I'm doing, and I'm, you know, and I'm making a drawing that is this, this, this very powerful image that has a whole history and old tradition, but I'm actually making it. And when I'm done, I hold it and I, I look at it. There's something about that, which is, which is real in a way that just thinking about things is definitely not. Well, I, I agree. I, and I think, um, I think the way in which our embodiment is, as you said, you used heaven and earth. I use like top down and bottom up, but it's the it's the same uh, metaphor. Um, the the way that that's the nexus point where the two come together, and we where we, it's also where you know it's where our skills and our theories come together. Um, and, and 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 if and this is something that's being emphasized. And and if we and, and if we lose uh, to a significant degree, we have we 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 especially with the prevalence of ideology, these have been disconnected. You and I have talked about this, Jonathan, in fact, that, you know, you know, the, the way ideology has a lot of religious action associated with it, but the idea part and the action part are actually not co connected to the cultivation of skills or virtues. And, and that, 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 that separation is another, uh, uh, another cause of the meeting crisis. So I think, stories about embodiment that bring that out and bring it out as an alternative uh, to um, more purely ideological ways of understanding these patterns. I think we're going to see them emerging. I think we're going to see them emerging. Great. I wanted to come on to a question from Tracy B. Tracy, are you, are you here? see your yes i'm here 
Are you happy to ask the question or would you like me to ask it? Sorry, I'm just trying to get my stuff together. That's okay. No worries. I just put it into the chat, which might be a little easier to, to find. That was the one that got voted highest. And it, it was interesting because David Harvey just mentioned the, the Gnostics as well. Um, was a lot of stories, including the Matrix, Star Wars, can fall short of a full religious experience, drawing from very creative Gnosticism. And that uh, your question also includes Gnosticism. So I thought it might be quite nice to, to bring that one in. So, yeah, um, it's basically, would you say that this meaning crisis that we're experiencing is um, primarily a Western Judeo-Christian world phenomenon? Would you say it's, and um, then what are your views on this concept of Gnosticism, which are, um, where there was this split in early Christianity between the, the Gnostics and the Roman Catholic interpretation. Um, and it's the Roman Catholic interpretation which became the dominant doctrine. And some would say it kind of belied the, the truth of the Gnostic truth. Um, and it's up to debate which is the real truth, but, um, and this more autocratic doctrine, um, yeah, do you think it's the, the anti-autocratic doctrine a lie to some that might be the core at some of the breakdown and meaning that the West seems to be experiencing? I don't know if you do you want to start, Paul. Uh, do you want to start, John? I can I can start. Uh, well, I don't. I think that there's something in what you said. I think that the meaning crisis. I think we're the cause of it. <laughs> I think, but I think the infection of the meaning crisis is definitely worldwide by now. I don't think that it it has remained with us. I I do think that the that Western tradition, in its own development, brought about the the this kind of meaning crisis. But it's not like I said. I don't think that by as 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 of now, I don't think that it's only a Western problem. It's a un, It's a worldwide problem. It may be more accentuated in the West, but it's everywhere. Uh, in terms of what you said, I think that the whole Gnostic question is such a big question. I, I don't, I, I feel like if we, maybe John and I one day can have an actual discussion about that. Uh, I think he would probably like that. Uh, I, maybe I can only, one of the problems we have is knowing exactly what the Gnostics were about. That's one problem because a lot of the traditions in which the Gnostics were pulling out of are lost to us. And we find these texts in the desert and we read them and we try to reconstruct what the Gnostics actually thought. Then we have Irenaeus and his, his attack on Gnosticism. And so we don't know whether he was accurate in his description of what they believed or whether, and so it's really difficult to regain what the Gnostics thought. But what I can, what I can phrase for you is why the, the, Christ, the Catholic or the Orthodox position phrased things the way they did. They, they phrased things the way they did to preserve certain things. One, they did it to preserve the goodness of creation because in, at least in their perception, there are ways in which the Gnostics presented the world in which the world itself was evil, that the physical world itself is evil, that this is how Christians at least perceive what the Gnostics believe, that, 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 that manifest reality is in itself uh, uh, evil. And so they, what they posited was to preserve the original goodness of creation. And then second of all, was to preserve the incarnational principle. That is to preserve the notion that Christ was both God and man. And in that vision that there is a place, there's a possibility for the physical created world to be fully and completely united with the divine principle. And that this is not this is not only is it possible, but it is the very purpose of why reality exists. That is the reason for why creation exists, why everything, everything exists so that it can become a vehicle, a, a vessel for manifestation of, of God. And so that is, the, that is the reason why Christians, let's say, phrase their theology the way they did. All the early, all the early Christological debates, that's all they're about. They're all about making sure that we say Christ is a man and making sure that we say Christ is God and finding a way to say it so that it's not confused. Uh, and, and like I said, the reason to do that is, is to preserve those things. And so whether I feel like the modern world is actually like, 
the modern world is, let's say in transhumanism and in a lot of the strains that we're seeing now, that it's actually quite Gnostic in the kind of anti-natalism, the kind of anti, the, this, this hatred of, even in the ecological movement, you see a form of hatred of man, like a, an idea that man is somehow bad, or that the things we do in the world are in themselves bad. And to me, I see at least what the Christians understood Gnosticism to be in those strains. Where it's like, we have to transcend that what it is to be human. We have to, we have to go beyond what, what, what is human. And, and, and almost this idea as if like, as if this dirty humanity, like we need to get out of it, right? We need to get out of this dirty body. Um, and that's definitely something that Christians did not, uh, did not embrace. So, but I'm sure John will have his own take because he probably has a very different perception of Gnosticism uh, than the one I have. First of all, John, then let's do that talk because I, um, I think there's a lot there and I, I would love to have that talk with you. Uh, first of all, uh, but the, the, let's do the first point first. Um, I think Jonathan is right. I, in which way it's spreading and how it's spreading, it, it, it's, it's, uh, I think the West is some important um, hub in the small world network of, of, of the meeting crisis. Um, but uh, I know like there's, there's increasingly, the, you know, there's the, I forget the Japanese name, there's a, you know, this whole generation of individuals that retreat into virtual world. And uh, I, th this is just a clear, and it's a particularly, uh, it's a particular, I mean, we share it with them. We have people who have video game addiction, but the Japanese version of this is particularly like startling and, and, and stark. Um, definitely meeting crisis. You can see the Kyoto School of Nishitani and Nishida at the beginning of the 20th century responding uh, to the meeting crisis. And this is while Japan is, you know, actually in military and um, political ascendance. Um, so uh, that's happening. Uh, I, I, I'm gonna be interviewed later today by uh, somebody from the Chinese community uh, uh, and the, the interest in this uh, post-cultural revolution in China um, there is something very much like a meaning crisis, the, the post-trauma there, um, and the fact that the Communist Party has had this, has basically cut people off from their wisdom traditions while sort of pretending that it, it says they're okay, but then persecuting them if they try to, like, so I think there's, I think there's both causes that stem from us, but also uh, endogenous ca causes within Japan and within China for why the meaning crisis is taking root there as well. Um, so I think it's, it's both factors. Um, about Gnosticism, uh, um, uh, and, and this is not where you're gonna have Jonathan's on one side and I'm on the other, at least not initially. My attitude, and I argued for this explicitly in the meaning crisis towards Gnosticism is one of deep ambivalence. Um, I, I'm deeply ambivalent to Gnosticism. I, I agree with uh, Jonathan, I think, I think there is a, a point of consensus that is emerging in the scholarship. I read quite a bit about it. Um, I, I think uh, contra Jung and other people, I don't think there was Gnosticism as a religion. I think the, the analogy that is better is Gnosticism is something like fundamentalism. It is a style or way of doing a whatever religion you want. So you could, you could in this analogy, be a Gnostic Christian, a Gnostic Jew, uh, a Gnostic pagan. And, and, and there's good evidence that that's actually the case. So I think Gnosticism is much more like a style of how you carry out your spirituality uh, rather than a particular group of people with their own coherent history and tradition. Uh, that being said, I think there are two elements in Gnosticism. One element that I really like is the centrality placed on Gnosis. Uh, so the Greeks have multiple terms for knowing. We have one because we're stupid, just like we have one word for love because we're stupid, right? The Greeks, the Greeks have, you know, episteme, which is like our theoretical knowledge, techne, which is skilled knowledge, right? They have gnosis, which is like what you have when you have powerful insight and it, it comes to fruition and like mystical experience, but they have, they, they have gnos, but then they have gnosis and we still have it in words like diagnosis or prognosis. And this, this is the kind of knowing that, it, right, the first is propositional, episteme, techne is procedural, nous, notice, knowing, insight is perspectival, and gnosis is participatory knowing. And, and, and recovering that, that's why the doctor has to have the bedside manner when he diagnoses you. He has to participate in you, right? Um, 
And so the Gnostics put a tremendous emphasis and there must have been a reason for this. And again, it's not particularly doctrinal because you could be a Gnostic of many different doctrinal, doctrinal sets. They're, they're putting an emphasis on, on this participatory knowing as being particularly relevant to helping people who feel stuck, who have a kind of existential inertia, who don't know, who know, and this is what people have when they go into therapy. They feel stuck. They know they want to be there and they can tell you what's wrong with them in propositions and they can describe the place they want to be in, but they don't know how to become that person. They don't have the requisite ability. They don't have the Gnosis. So there was something going on there that was important. And then there were, so I think that's valuable. And then as DeConnick argues in the Gnostic New Age, there, there was this sense of trying to challenge uh, the grammar of slavery and servitude that had been a perennial association uh, with spirituality, that perhaps uh, we, we shouldn't think of our relationship to the gods as one of slavery or servitude. And I think here the Gnostics have sort of won underground through time because that way of talking about relationship to God, even within the Orthodox traditions, even within Islam, who had, whose name means submission, that's receding uh, um, as the primary way. And so the Gnostics were trying to challenge that very ancient model. And I think there's something important there. Now, what, what that does though, is it tends to produce a mythos, as Jonathan says, of the degradation and the denigration of the world. The world is evil. And it just leads to this massive, it's the mother of all conspiracy theories, right? That there's this, there's these horrible powers and principalities that are at work to keep us in prison from realizing our true nature. And by the way, this term was used by the Gnostics, our true nature as the master race. Um, and so there's all kinds of associations there with all kinds of versions of Gnosticism and grand conspiracy theories that I think are particularly problematic. So um, I think we should have a very complex, I'm arguing for a very complex and ambivalent stance uh, towards Gnosticism. And perhaps uh, that would give uh, fertile ground for Jonathan and I to have uh, a more at length discussion. There's definitely the potential for a good discussion about Gnosticism at some point. Um, so I'd like to uh, invite Adriana to ask her question from the document. I'm going to put it into the chat again. Um, yes, hi. <clears throat> I think this is um, this is more this is for both actually. I was thinking more of Jonathan, but I'm curious about. Um, so in the book Religion of Tomorrow by Ken Wilber, which I'm not sure if you're both familiar with, um, he talks about the growing up of religion and how they would look like. Uh, one of the criticisms of religion from, from that perspective is that originally it was meant to be an avenue for waking up and the Western psychological practices would be more focused on growing up. However, religion had divorced itself from both waking up and growing up and became dogmatic and, and not really... Um, and it, anything that catalyzed anything really uh, from that perspective. So he was, um, he was just saying, how, so when you talk, so that's for you, Jonathan, when you talk about keeping the wisdom of the religions and making them rel relevant today, what are you speaking about? Um, what should we keep, so include, and what should we throw away, transcend in religion? To make, to, and that's um, coming also from the perspective that when these books were written, um, we people were in a certain developmental stage, so maybe more mythical, and there was the way they were, um, their psychology was living in a certain place, and and also these books can be interpreted from a, a, a very different stages of development. So just, yeah, I don't know if I'm making it more complicated, well, but I'd love to. Okay, I would say I would. I'm going to be a little harsh here. I'm sorry, but I would say that. The manner in which Ken Wilber presents this, it's exactly the thing that I want to avoid. It's exactly what I want to avoid. I want to avoid to, to give you the impression that I'm standing above religion, that I'm smarter than all these people, that I'm wiser than all these people. And now I have the capacity to decide what I'm going to keep and what I'm going to uh, discard from these traditions that have been handed to me from my father. That is not at all how I how I approach it. I approach it rather as as these people, St. Paul, Augustine, Aquinas, even if there's some things I might not totally agree with them, they were smarter than I am. 
they were a lot smarter than I am. And they, they, they had a way better understanding of both human psychology and metaphysical, the connection between psychological reality and metaphysical reality than we do today. And so what I want to do is I want to humbly recover and try to find the golden nuggets that, that are there in the things that I feel like if I don't understand what's in scripture, it's me that's a problem. It's not scripture. Uh, and it's interesting because if you read, if it, it, it's, it's obvious that, that someone who reacts like this to religion is reacting to the most superficial form, a kind of American evangelical uh, you know, consumer Christianity, but that is a very recent phenomenon. And all through all of Christian history, even if you look, even in, in the, if you look in, in during, in, during the enlightenment, there was still Jacob Berm and there was still these extremely mystical uh, Christian characters that were there and were trying to help people see what these texts are really about. In Judaism, you have very high mystical rabbis uh, all the way up to the modern age, all the way up to, to now, up to now. And so to me, it's, it's really about for us to rediscover what this is really about and to, to re-understand what, what the, the depth and the power it has to transform us uh, rather than stand above it and decide what I'm going to keep and what I'm, what I'm going to throw away. And so that's kind of my, that's kind of, that's my, that, that's the whole, if you want to understand the whole reason why I take the stance I do, it has to do with statements like that, where someone can tell me that religion needs to grow up. And I'm like, how grown up are you to, to, to say that? Like, where are you standing in the stratosphere of intellectual and spiritual realization that you're going to that you're going to tell a 2000 year old tradition that it needs to grow up? I don't know. Like, I'm struggling to understand where you're standing. Anyway, sorry. Sounds like there's a great discussion to be had with Ken Wilber as well. Coming up. <laughs> Looking forward to that one. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I think that's true. Um, I agree a lot. Well, I do agree a lot with Jonathan. Um, but he, uh, and I know Jonathan is not saying that we don't have the I don't know if this is the right word we don't have the right to criticize religions I, I don't think he's saying that at all because uh, I've seen him do it and I've seen him be open to it so I just want to make sure that that's on the table um, I divided awakening from the meaning crisis exactly in half between a historical analysis and a scientific analysis and the reason I did the first half the historical analysis was to do due diligence to exactly what Jonathan said. I think these people and these traditions have tremendous wisdom and we have to really wrestle with it deeply and in a transformative fashion. And having just a superficial understanding of these traditions, I think is tremendously dangerous. Um, and I, 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 I get worried at times, I have the book, I haven't read it. It's so big, um, I just mean physically. Um, so I, I, I just don't have time to do it right now. Uh, but some of the Wilbur stuff I've seen with these schemas, uh, when I, when, you know, when, when this, uh, I, I'm really worried about uh, uh, um, a, a, a very easy history and a very easy taxonomy of things. So um, I share Jonathan's concern. So I devoted half of the Awakening from the Meaning Crisis precisely to take that history really respectfully, seriously. However, and this is maybe again where I might disagree with Jonathan, although maybe not completely, I have the second half of the series on the science and Aquinas, and you know what Aquinas and Augustine and Dionysus people that Jonathan knows I respect tremendously they didn't they they and you know Aquinas and Dionysus especially Aquinas he was willing to use the best science of his time and he, he and he was radical in his time for doing that he, he came close to be, be being uh, declared a heretic and and we have new science um, and, and, and and I think that has to be taken seriously and so I, I don't think that the science puts me in a hubristic place where I'm standing above the traditions. Um, I, it shouldn't. The science has to, has to be dialogically, deeply dialogically responsible to the history. But I think the science can give us tools by which we can evaluate these things that were not available within those traditions. And I think we have to take that seriously as well. And, and, and see, this is also my criticism. And again, I have to read more Wilbur, so I'm saying this very cautiously. And I might, I don't know how good his science is. It's, it, the, from what I've read, it's not that great in terms of what I know about cognition. Um, 
And so I need to read more. So that's a preliminary. I'm, I, I may have to revise that with time, but I, I, I worry that it's not very deep science either. Yeah, that's something to return to for sure. Sorry, um, that, was, that was harsh as well. Uh, sorry. <laughs> no, he, uh, I got an email from him the other day and he's back in the game. So we can maybe get him on to defend himself at some point. Um, we've got a few minutes left and I just wanted to um, ask a question. You don't have to answer this, but I, I was watching your most recent conversation about protest and the religiosity of protest. And I thought your point, your discussion around the parallels between original sin and what we're seeing at the moment was really, really fascinating. And I'd love, I'd love if you could recap that for, for us. Jonathan, maybe I'll start because I brought that issue to you. I wanted to thank Jonathan again. Um, if, you, if you get a chance to watch that, uh, um, it, I typically not a, a very personal, in, like I don't bring up my own autobiography um, as a, in great detail, but I needed to in that particular situation. And Jonathan was a really sensitive and responsible host to that. And um, and, and, and I thought the discussion was mutually beneficial. So I wanted to thank him for that right now. Um, so I wanna be very, very clear what I'm saying here. And there was a lot of nuance in that. And I'm worried because of brevity of time, I'm gonna get misconstrued. Uh, and I don't want Jonathan to be misconstrued either. I think there are real issues around police brutality. There's real issues about um, the economic system attempting to disenfranchise, the ac political economic system attempting to disenfranchise black people and other people of color. I think the evid empirical evidence for that is pretty non-controversial. However, I, I made use of a distinction that the sociologist Max Weber made between manifest and latent. You can talk about the manifest goals of any movement or organization, what it explicitly says it's trying to do, and you can compare that to the latent functions that it actually performs. One of the classic examples that Weber gave is bureaucracy. What bureaucracy, its manifest function is to funnel information up and funnel information down, right? And that's what a bureaucracy is supposed to do. What bureauc a latent function of the, uh, bureaucracies is in what one people suffer for and Kafka made famous is they, they allow for a diffusion of responsibility and a, and a redistribution of blame. And that's one of the horrible functions of bureaucracies. And the trouble we have is we, and that's why Kafka pointed to the horror, trying to separate the manifest from the latent turns out to be very hard to do. I understand and I agree with a lot of the manifest goals of what are happening in these protests. So I am not addressing that. I wanna be really clear about that. But there's a latent functionality here in which people are doing these protests and it looks to me like they are enacting a lot of the, well, the symbolism of versions of Christianity where you have, like this happened right to somebody I know. He was in a situation where he was being told this, this the, the identity, uh, the politics of identity. And he, and he was saying, well, I feel guilty. <laughs> and, they, and, they, and they said, it's not enough for you to feel guilty, right? And it's like, well, what, what am I supposed to do? It's like, just, and, and the idea was he needed to somehow express infinite guilt. And, 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 and then the idea was, it's nothing that he personally did. He's just saddled with it. And, and that strikes me as very similar to at least a very, I don't know, if that, well, at least to my mind, an Augustinian view of original sin, that you're, you're born guilty and any attempts you have to alleviate that guilt are, are, are impossible because the guilt is so biasing and warping your thinking that everything you do to try and alleviate the guilt will just make it that much worse. And so you have to do, you have to give yourself over to some external thing that, uh, to, uh, uh, before which you abase yourself. And then that external authority has the power to pronounce you acceptable um, in some fashion. And so I saw a lot of this. And, and, and so I was like really, because I was brought up in that, I was really put off by that latent aspect of these, a lot of this, a lot of these protests that, that they seem to be enacting something like an, an accusation of original sin and a requirement 
that people abase themselves and genuflect and you have people literally kneeling, you have the toppling of the idol, like there's all this religious behavior going on that's supposed to somehow, it's not clear because it's not political action, it's not economic action, but somehow, and notice my hands waving rapidly, it is supposed to alleviate this guilt. And that struck me as a deeply unconscious, nevertheless powerful and collective response to the meaning crisis. And one that I found particularly um, difficult to personally encounter because I grew up with that. And that is a, a worldview that, uh, that I have tried to leave behind. And, and then Jonathan uh, responded to that in kind. Yeah, I mean, my main point about about that is the inevitability of of these of ritual, the inevitability of religion, and that we we can't avoid it. It's just part of being of meaning. To engage with meaning is to is to engage with somewhat ritualized uh, behavior. And my my main point is mostly that if you if you try to throw it out. And if you try to to get rid of it, it's going to come back, but it's going to come back in a distorted and and strange, disturbing way. And I think that that's what we're seeing in these, because like John said, it it's like a caricature of original sin, because because it's actually it is politicized in the end, because at least I don't agree with original sin. Orthodox Christians don't believe it in the same in that kind of that kind of uh, kind of stuff. But uh, at least original sin applied to everybody. Right, at least original sin applied to all human beings, and therefore the thing you had to give yourself up to was at least a transcendent, you know, kind of harsh God that I don't particularly like, but at least that's what it was. But now it's one group that has to give themselves up to another in order to receive this absolution, and the absolution doesn't actually come. It's almost like you have to live in perpetual, like a kind of state of perpetual guilt, and that's the state the only absolution you have is if you live in a state of perpetual kind of self-flagellating guilt. And, and the fact that it's done politically and it's one group against another is very dangerous. And it's also dangerous because it can flip at any time. And people don't realize that, that once you engage in these types of things, that it's not true that it's just going to go in one direction. Uh, that, that's like a word of caution to people who get, get into these types of behaviors. And, and we've seen this kind of stuff we saw in China. It's a struggle session. It's a you know, it's, it's that kind of, that kind of, that kind of thing. And we don't, I know it's a frightening to see it appear on the horizon again. Yeah. Thank you both for recapping that. And I highly recommend the, the discussion that Jonathan and John went into. I'll put it in the chat again uh, for anyone who might want to go and check it out. It was really, yeah, and it was very, it was wonderful also to see, both of you talking about your kind of backgrounds um, with with religion um, and being vulnerable around that. That was really uh, great to see John in particular. So we're now coming to the end. Thank you so much for everyone who asked questions. Sorry to everyone whose questions we didn't get around to. Um, we, I'm sure we'll do this again. And we would like to end and also say thank you so much to Jonathan and John for making time for this. And as we traditionally do at the end of these calls, I'd like to invite everyone to unmute themselves and say thank you to Jonathan and John for this experience and see everyone soon. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. 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 Thank you.